minutes just to introduce myself and go through some of the housekeeping notes before we uh, start. Uh, I'm Christina Kakaflikas, Acting Director of the Economic Growth, Culture and Entrepreneurship Department at the City of Markham. And uh, welcome to our virtual business event, Infrastructure Opportunities in Africa for Canadians. The City of Markham is proud to collaborate with Eschaton Consulting, Export Development Canada, Global Affairs Canada and Lee Group on this important webinar. Uh, this webinar was planned as an in-person event uh, for earlier this year in April. Uh, we had to switch gears, of course, due to the pandemic, but we're thrilled to be here with you today. Um, and in fact, we're actually thrilled to have casted the, wide, the, the net, I should say, a little wider, and we've welcomed some special guests today uh, whom the mayor will acknowledge uh, during his remarks. But uh, wanted to point to uh, the wonderful sort of representation we have today among our participants and thank everyone for joining. Uh, before we get, begin, I just wanted to go over our housekeeping notes. Um, if everyone can just stay on mute, please. And also, uh, if you can turn off your cameras, um, uh, we just want to preserve bandwidth and also for the recording. This session will be recorded and we will be sharing a link to the recording after this webinar along with the presentations. So all of the presentations you hear today and see on your screen will be shared with you after the event. Um, also, uh, in order to uh, preserve bandwidth, that uh, video will help us um, turning off your video will help us as well. You can send your questions during the course of the webinar. You can use the chat function and um, the questions will be addressed uh, after the presenters uh, make their presentations and uh, both during the moderated discussion and perhaps a little bit afterwards if we have some extra time. So with that, uh, it's now my sincere pleasure to welcome uh, Mayor Frank Scarpitti to make remarks. Uh, Mayor Scarpitti was first elected to Markham Council in 1985 as a regional councillor. He was first elected as mayor of Markham in 2006 and has now served Markham for more than 33 years on council and as mayor. And mayor Scarpitti works tire tirelessly in his capacity as the mayor of our city of Markham, but he also gives a lot of his time to a number of not-for-profit organizations uh, related to health, culture, and quality of life programming. We're very fortunate to have a mayor that's very supportive of business. And uh, with that, without further ado, I'll pass the mic over to our mayor to say some welcoming remarks. Well, thank you very much, uh, Christina, and uh, good morning to uh, everyone. Uh, it really is uh, an honor uh, for me uh, to be here and um, be participating in this uh, incredible economic uh, development uh, event. And um, now that everybody has shut off their videos, I really can't see and determine who, if full disclosure, who is suffering uh, as much as I am uh, this morning from the US election hangover. Uh, that uh, I don't know what the remedy is, uh, but anyways, uh, it might take a while for a remedy after what happened last night, but uh, certainly interesting times uh, around the world. And I think uh, certainly during this pandemic, it's become incredibly important to support each other and to build on the uh, relationships and the networks uh, that we have. Because uh, I think uh, even in the best of times, uh, the, that, that uh, opportunity is always important. And certainly uh, during in a pandemic and, and perhaps uh, politically challenging times, it's, it's even more important that uh, we do these things. So good morning to, to everyone. And thank you, Christina, for that uh, introduction. And want to thank uh, Christina and her team and, and economic development, along with obviously all of the partners that she mentioned for collaborating and, and coming together to support um, this, this uh, virtual event. Uh, this sort of seems to be the way of life these days. But I, again, I think it's critically important that, uh, that we do this. I also want to say this morning, I'm joined by uh, Alan Ho, who's the chair of our Economic uh, Development uh, Committee. And uh, I want to thank uh, Alan for his ongoing uh, commitment and, and support. And he's always uh, there uh, to make sure that Markham is at the forefront of, uh, of uh, helping people um, always, but certainly again, 
uh, during this pandemic, uh, Councillor Ho has, uh, has uh, eloquently said um, it's more critical that, that we continue to do these things and not lose sight of the fact that uh, uh, economic development is, is, does never really take a vacation. <laughs> That's for sure. And I thank him for, uh, for his energy. And also uh, the vice chair, uh, if you could just turn on your video just for a second, Hal, I know you're complying. I don't know how Christina did. It got you to comply so easily. I have to learn her tricks here. Uh, maybe I can use them during council meetings. But uh, I also want to welcome uh, Councillor uh, Halid Usman, who's the vice chair of the Economic uh, Development uh, Committee. And uh, anyone that knows uh, Councillor Usman just knows that uh, he never stops uh, building bridges with uh, various cultural uh, communities and uh, particularly when it comes to uh, advancing economic development. So thank you to the, to the both of, of you. And uh, Christina, uh, I say that uh, we've always relied on you and your team uh, at economic development, but more so uh, today, uh, I'd say, than, than ever before. Um, there's no doubt uh, that economic development just doesn't happen by accident. It takes a real effort on everyone's part and I want to thank you and, and Sandra Tam. Uh, I hope she's been able to, to join us. Uh, can't see all the squares here. Sandra, thank you for turning on your, your video, but uh, appreciate uh, your efforts and, and really your, your entire team. And uh, forgive me uh, for some of the mispronunciations that may happen over the next uh, minute or so here. There's a lot of people to sort of uh, uh, acknowledge. Uh, but uh, Tafuma Amuse uh, with Eshan Solutions, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for reaching out to us in an effort to uh, to collaborate on on this uh, on this uh, event. And I want to thank you uh, for your uh, ongoing work and and really uh, understanding uh, the opportunities uh, that exist in Africa. And uh, want to say thank you for. Uh, your leadership, and uh, uh, we look forward to uh, an ongoing collaboration because these things are not one-day events. Uh, they're, they're, this may open the door to many opportunities, but we know that once that door is open that we have to continue to, to work together. So I thank you, sir, for the incredible uh, work that, that uh, you're, you're doing. Um, also to Lisa, Lisa Pogue, um, uh, from the Commissioner from uh, Global Affairs uh, Canada. Uh, thank you, Lisa. The federal government uh, has had to do a lot of things these days. And uh, again, I want to say thank you to you. Uh, as I said, economic development and opportunities don't ever take a, a vacation and can't be distracted. Uh, in fact, uh, sometimes, uh, as right now, uh, more effort is required. And we thank uh, all of the efforts of the federal government over the past uh, several months. Uh, Kevin Sullivan, the Senior Manager of Mid-Market Export uh, Development Canada. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kevin, uh, for being here. And of course, uh, I will, uh, thanks, Kevin. I uh, appreciate people just turning on their video because, uh, well, not only just for me, I mean, it's for everyone. I wanna make sure, you know you're gonna be speaking at some point, but uh, you know, it's just great to say, okay, where are these people in this room? Uh, it's a bit more challenging sometimes uh, depending on the screens to, to be able to see everyone. Uh, but again, uh, thank you and look forward to, uh, to your comments as well. And I uh, also take great pride in, in acknowledging and I hope that he will turn on his video too if he hasn't already. John Farrell, President of Lee International. Um, John, uh, your, your, uh, your knowledge and uh, again, uh, just your global network is, is something that we treasure uh, in, uh, in the city of Markham. So uh, when I saw the program and, and saw your name attached to, uh, to this, um, it made perfect sense. So I thank you for your mm -hmm. ongoing work. We're very, very proud of you and very proud of uh, Lee uh, uh, International. So uh, just to give you a quick uh, overview, uh, I, I think many of you probably know that the, the city of Markham is a uh, along with York Region, uh, the second largest IT hub in all of Canada. And uh, fair to say that uh, when we know as, as uh, mighty as all the companies that make up the hub here, 
uh, that we're not alone. We're a central part of uh, the innovation corridor uh, throughout uh, southern Ontario. Um, 16th uh, largest city in, in, in Canada. Uh, but I think we, we really stand out in, in so many ways. And I think um, today's, uh, today's webinar is another indication of the, the sort of DNA of our city. We're the most diverse uh, city in, in all of Canada. And you know, when you sort of live and breathe it every day, you kind of take this for granted, but uh, through the opportunities of, of a couple of these events over the past few months, I sometimes see the astonishment of people, uh, sometimes through their faces and then sometimes through their reference in, in remarks, but we are the most diverse, uh, almost 80% of the people, it's a bit of an oxymoron, but identify themselves as a visible minority and over 65% of the people that live in our community were born outside of Canada. And that has made, I think, for just an incredible dynamic uh, community, uh, one that has attracted uh, international talent uh, to the city of Markham, many of whom have come here highly skilled and, and highly educated, and it's just positioned us so well, um, not only for uh, the IT sector, but for uh, another hub that we have here in professional services, particularly in engineering uh, services. So the city is, is very fortunate to have over a hundred engineering and consulting firms. And I uh, uh, have to say it's a sector that has, has done uh, very well. Uh, when you take a look at uh, the professional services and technical services here, uh, though those sectors grew by uh, almost 20% between uh, 2015 and 2019 and continues to be uh, an important growth sector for the city of Markham. For those of you that, that know the GTA well, um, you know, uh, really the main intersection, and it's interesting how sort of uh, one company moves into a neighborhood and it spurs other companies to want to be in that same neighborhood, but some of these companies that I'll mention, you, you just have to kind of be at the intersection of 404 and 407 and look around and you'll see these big names that are not only doing work here in uh, Markham and across Canada and across North America, but they are, and as I said, in, in John's case and, and others too, they're doing uh, work globally, incredibly important work and uh, again makes us very proud of these uh, Canadian companies that have uh, are having that that global impact so companies like Worley Parsons Canada Lee Consulting Cole Engineering WSP and uh, Acom uh, and there's certainly uh, many many more but those are some of the giants of uh, those signs that you'll see when you drive into that uh, particular uh, employment neighborhood. So the, the wonderful diversity, the highly skilled talent uh, that we have really uh, is why these companies have come here and, and continue to, to grow. Uh, they rely on that international talent. And to be honest with you, uh, it's um, you know, sort of icing on the cake. I mean, not only are they uh, highly educated and highly skilled, but they're incredible ambassadors to be able to do some of the international work that these uh, companies do. So uh, I hope it's been clear that Markham is connected globally and we take great pride in that. And, and certainly uh, in the best of times, uh, it's important. But again, um, as the world faces the, the current pandemic and all of the challenges, these global connections are extremely important. So we uh, certainly believe in, in fostering and uh, um, fostering economic and cultural exchange with, with many communities uh, around the world. It's something that uh, we have always been active in. And um, again, today's another example that we haven't slowed down in that effort and uh, it's important work. And, and I think, uh, again, when we do these things, it's not something that, that we do alone. Uh, we really do work with individuals like John who help connect us to communities that, that Lee Consulting is in, uh, but we also do it with many uh, business and, and cultural uh, organizations as well. We see those local connections uh, as critical components of us being able to be successful around the world. 
and um, again, we rely on on their um, on their network and, and their information on the ground um, to be able to uh, assist us with that. And so, in, in 2016, I think it's a wonderful example of how uh, Lee Consulting uh, helped us tremendously with a business mission that uh, we led to uh, to India. And uh, I will look forward to John's uh, presentation as he talks about. Uh, these experiences and uh, certainly um, the opportunities uh, in particular with, uh, with the infrastructure um, opportunities uh, in, in Africa. So we're, we're certainly um, committed uh, here in, in the city of Markham when it comes to uh, trade and inclusive trade, uh, trade that is um, certainly important about economic development, but also a sustainable uh, trade. And um, there's no greater opportunities than uh, infrastructure as it relates to all kinds of things, whether it's uh, transportation and water systems, uh, but also ensuring that these, uh, these projects uh, not only enhance the economic development of countries uh, that these companies are doing business in, but actually uh, end up in enhancing our, our world. It's, uh, it's important work. So I, I, I feel like I'm probably preaching this next uh, little part to the converted here, but, but Africa is just an incredible opportunity for uh, many uh, Canadian companies. And I think uh, all of you wouldn't be here if you didn't realize uh, that, but it's uh, the world's fastest growing region with the six of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world by GDP. Uh, rapidly um, um, urban population that, that's growing and the largest workforce globally. Uh, it's been projected by the year 2035 and the biggest free trade area since the WTO and the need, uh, as I said, for new and improved uh, infrastructure is, is critical. And just to give you a bit of a glimpse, because I know the other speakers will, will certainly address this in, in much more detailed uh, uh, information, but according to the African Development Bank, Africa requires an annual investment of between 130 and 170 billion dollars to close the infrastructure gap. Now, uh, I can tell you as a municipal politician, uh, our, our infrastructure gap uh, is a lot smaller than that uh, when you <laughs> compare those dollars. And I know how hard it is for us to, to close that gap. So, uh, this is, uh, this is just an incredible opportunity for global players to, to be able to serve in a way that, that helps uh, Africa uh, advance that, that infrastructure gap. So this morning's discussion is really about un unlocking and understanding these new, uh, new, new opportunities for, for, for Canada. And again, uh, to Fuma, uh, thank you for inspiring this uh, this uh, uh, webinar along with Dr. Norman uh, Musea. And I also wanna take a, a moment to acknowledge um, uh, Minister Mary Ng, who uh, I know has a message uh, for us. Uh, Minister Ng is the Minister of Small Business Export Promotion and Trade. And I have to say uh, an important link for us uh, because she's a member of parliament uh, from the city of Markham and uh, her leadership uh, over the past several months uh, during this pandemic to assist businesses uh, to provide the, the level of support that uh, particularly small and medium businesses need in, in order to survive beyond the pandemic has been uh, really awe-inspiring. So I thank her for taking the time to, uh, to participate uh, here and uh, for all the work that, that she's doing. <coughs> Excuse me. And... Again, um, I apologize uh, uh, in advance. Uh, I just want to recognize some of the, uh, the special guests that I understand will, will be attending uh, the seminar uh, today. Um, Her Excellency uh, Fatima Bralawe, Mete, Ambassador of Mali in, in Canada. Ms. Thendiwi Fadan, Consul General, uh, Consul uh, General of the Republic of South Africa uh, in Toronto, uh, Ms. Adele Fori, Consul uh, General 
of the Republic of South Africa in Toronto, the Honorable uh, Mohamed Ajay Sawa, Mayor of Accra, Ghana, represented by uh, Salem uh, Adesman, Director of Waste Management Department of the Accra Metropolitan Assembly. And then we're also uh, pleased to welcome um, two uh, Council Generals uh, from the Council General's Office uh, of Ghana, uh, Alexander Ben Aqua and uh, Danny Achan Pong. And uh, again, I apologize. Uh, uh, I know um, I am uh, I'm someone who experiences different variations of my last name, and so I apologize, but I just want to say uh, with all of our sincerity, we, we thank all of you for, for coming here. Uh, each and every one of you, I think, play an important role in connecting uh, Canadian businesses with these opportunities uh, that exist uh, in Africa. And with that, uh, again, uh, thank you to you, Christina, and your team, and uh, look forward to hearing some of these uh, presentations. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we'll now play the video from uh, Minister Ng. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. I'm happy that technology allows me to share a few words with you today. I want to thank Mayor Scarpitti and the City of Markham for your hard work and leadership and for bringing everyone together today. I also want to thank my good friends, Councillors Alan Ho and Hollett Usman for your work on the Economic Development and Culture Committee and for your tremendous leadership in our community. Canadians have come together and made sacrifices to limit the spread of COVID-19. With our collective continued efforts to stop the spread of the virus, Canada will be in a better place and prepared for a sustainable economic recovery. On top of the emergency financial support during this crisis, a critical part of the recovery is supporting our small and medium-sized businesses to scale up and to access new markets, including in the, vinet, in the vibrant and dynamic markets across Africa. International trade is key to our economic recovery, and after everything we have been through with this pandemic, it remains true that Africa wants more of Canada, and Canada wants more of Africa. I saw this firsthand back in February when I attended the Mining and Dabra Conference in South Africa and led a business trade mission to both Kenya and Ethiopia, where I was joined by Prime Minister Trudeau. Everywhere I went, I saw businesses from Canada and Africa building relationships, learning from each other, and sharing innovative ideas and solutions. With that spirit of cooperation, I believe we can build on the $9.7 billion worth of merchandise trade that Canada did with African nations in 2019. Growing our trade links with African partners is necessary for our mutual economic recovery. We can build on the momentum of understanding on infrastructure development using public-private partnerships that Canada and Ethiopia signed in 2019. Canada is also pursuing negotiations with Ethiopia to develop a foreign investment promotion and protection agreement, which would provide Canadian investors and businesses with a more transparent and predictable trading environment, not to mention to the nine such investment agreements that Canada already has with other African countries. Our government is continuing to work with businesses to make sure that you have the tools that you need to succeed in the international marketplace, particularly around developing infrastructure projects abroad. We know that infrastructure development will be even more important as a driver to economic recovery as we all rebuild from COVID-19. And as you look to grow your businesses into Africa, I encourage you to take advantage of Export Development Canada, as well as Canada's Trade Commissioner Service, or as I call them, Canada's best sales and business development team around the world. They're 150 years old and they operate in 160 offices across the world. They are truly exceptional at helping Canadian businesses do well in, uh, in the countries to which they want to pursue businesses. As one Team Canada, our government and our organizations, whether it is the Trade Commissioner Service, Export Development Canada, or Business Development Bank of Canada, we're all working together to help Canadian business owners succeed in the international marketplace. 
I know today there are representatives from both the Trade Commissioner Service as well as Export Development Canada who's participating in the discussion. I know that they will offer a wide range of uh, advice and information around funding, resources, on the ground connections that will help you take your business to the next level in Africa. And as we continue to deal with the uncertainties of COVID-19, what we know here is that our government will continue to be here with you every single step of the way. That is our commitment. And I look forward to continuing that work, supporting our Canadian businesses throughout this pandemic so that we can get to the other side of this pandemic and to bridge to better times. I want to thank you all for taking this time to listen to me. Enjoy your day and enjoy this event. Thank you so much. Thank you, Minister Ng. I believe we had a bit of a sound interruption for a portion of Minister Ng's talk. Uh, what we can do is try to send the link out to everyone as part of our follow-up to this meeting. I apologize for that uh, uh, glitch, but um, I think we heard most of Minister Ng's remarks and, um, and how incredibly supportive the minister has been to Canadian businesses and her particular interest in uh, the potential uh, relationship, uh, building the relationship between Africa and Canada. And now I'll uh, introduce Councillor Ho um, for brief remarks. Councillor Ho is the chair of our Economic Development and Culture Committee at the City of Markham. And he's an entrepreneur himself. He, he has many years experience in the private sector before joining the City of Markham as councillor. And he brings a, a real depth of understanding of, of business. And uh, thank you for your leadership, Councillor Ho. Please, uh, please uh, continue with your remarks. Thank you, Christina. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. First of all, I would like to thank you uh, all for tuning in virtually for this exciting discussion. Uh, as chair of the city's uh, Economic Development and Culture Committee, I'm proud of the work the team has been doing to support businesses during the pandemic. These indeed are unusual times, but the pandemic should not be a roadblock to trade. Instead, it is a time for diversification. From my personal experience, I know the dynamic and growing markets of Africa present opportunities for Canadian businesses. With my working experiences in South Africa, Lesotho and Egypt about 30 years ago, I know firsthand the potential for growth and development on African continent. Africa, is one of the fastest growing economic regions in the world. Many African countries have signed long-term agreements with many European countries on natural supplies, such as Egyptian corn. That is something, you know, uh, I, I, I dealt with, you know, for, for many years. African fruits and producers raw diamond and raw materials. There are many other sectors with growth opportunities. Recent economic expansion in Africa has also emphasized the need for infrastructure investment, such as roads, bridges, and reservoirs, et cetera, et cetera. And as a member of Rotary Club, I know that universal access to clean water in Africa has been one of the Rotary's missions for many, many years. And that also creates a demand for water and drainage infrastructure technology and the clean tech sector more broadly. Markham has a strong engineering, infrastructure design and consulting community that is globally active. This webinar is meant to raise awareness of business opportunities in Africa for Markham and Canadian companies. I look forward to working together with the business community and our partners to explore businesses opportunities in Africa. So once again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ho. And without further ado, uh, we'll now begin the uh, portion of our program, uh, beginning with um, uh, 
a Tapuma Musewe, and uh, then following uh, with a moderated um, discussion uh, with our panelists. So just quickly, I wanted to thank personally uh, Tapuma for uh, your leadership and uh, Dr. Norman, uh, uh, Dr. Norman Musewe as well um, for uh, bringing this idea and, and concept to our attention. And it's been a pleasure working with you. Uh, Tapuma is a trade and investment executive dedicated to increasing the connectivity between African markets and other regions of the world. Um, grew up in Canada, spent a lot of time in Africa, has a depth of knowledge, and we're really pleased that uh, he's here with us today, founder of Escaton Solutions, a boutique, firm, a boutique firm that promotes sustainable trade and investment with African markets. Without further ado, Tapuma, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Christina. It's an absolute pleasure to uh, be here with you this today. Let me say today, so this morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are. And um, I'd love to just acknowledge all of our distinguished guests, both here in Canada and um, across the continent. Thank you for joining us this morning. And I'd also especially like to thank Mayor Scarpiti. It's been an absolute pleasure working with you and your team to ensure that this event happens. We had to pivot as has been mentioned. It's been, you know, there've been the challenges of COVID that have not made it easy, but um, the team has been really flexible and committed to sustainable trade and investment with Africa. So this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Mayor Scapiti. Um, I'd also like to thank you, Christina and Sandra. It's been a pleasure working with you. So without any further ado, I am going to uh, move into my brief presentation. Now, some of you, um, Councillor Ho and Mayor Scarpiti, have provided such a great overview of Africa that um, I feel in terms of overview, there's little left to say but I'm still gonna continue anyways, and hopefully um, this will just help you. If, if it's your first time um, being exposed to some of, uh, to the continent of Africa and understanding the demographics and economics around it, then hopefully this will give you um, a good picture before we then go into a more granular approach uh, with the rest of the speakers. So Escaton Solutions, uh, my consultancy was established a few years ago with a vision to usher in a new era of trade, collaboration, and partnership between Africa and other regions of the world. We offer three main service offerings, which is investment advisory, trade advisory, and developing or co-developing innovation projects. In terms of sectors, we're agnostic, but we tend to spend a lot of time in agriculture, infrastructure, and clean technology. Um, and I would say that infrastructure is critical um, to all of these other sectors. Um, I would also like to mention the team that has worked on this Markham project. So it's been myself, Dr. Norman Musewe, and Philip Adjaman. We are all Markham stakeholders. Um, and this is why it's been so important uh, to see Markham take the lead in this. Dr. Norman Musewe has had a private practice as well in Markham for, for about 30 years. And uh, so I think another thing that's important is that we are also African stakeholders. So that's by virtue of our ancestry, but it's also the three of us actually started a logistics company. It was small but successful in South Africa a few years ago. And so we're very acquainted and very aware um, of the need for good infrastructure on the continent. And these are some of our partners that we've worked with in the past. I've got a glance. So firstly, Africa is just massive. It's huge. It's 55 countries, over 2,000 languages, 1.3 billion people. When we talk about the trajectories of growth, it has the highest fertility rate in the world. <clears throat> its population is expected to double by 2050. It's also got the fastest rate of urbanization, as was mentioned by Mayor Scarpiti. So we will have around 14 megacities probably by 2030 and some of the world's fastest growing economies. Now, um, as you heard, five to six of the 10 fastest growing economies by GDP have typically come from Africa. If you look at this map here in the, in the background, um, this is sourced from the IMF, and this is a heat map which shows the current state of, of GDP growth in real, real GDP terms um, across the world. And you can see that the red parts represent growth of less than three, minus 3%. So this is under COVID conditions and most of North America and South America are almost exclusively red. You can see large parts of Asia, Europe, um, and Australia, New Zealand are also red. When you look at Africa, it's, it's really clear here 
that the economies are growing um, even above 0%. So some of them are growing above 3%, such as Egypt and South Sudan. So, um, the, so African economies are, are very, very resilient. Not only have they been the fastest growing, even under these conditions, they're extremely resilient. <coughs> Excuse me. A couple of key trends I wanted to highlight, some things you might have seen in the news recently. Um, on the top left there, you'll see a graphic which comes from a BBC article on the, um, on the COVID case fatality ratio. So what you can see at the very bottom, if you can see it, is a sliver um, next to where it says Africa. So this graph here, this graph, um, when compared to other regions in the world, you can see that the case fatality ratio in Africa is very, very small. And uh, this is something which is verifiable. There have been studies on this. This is not just happenstance. You know, we've, we've been seven, eight months under the pandemic, and this is the trend. So we have a low COVID case fatality ratio. Pay stack in the, in the, in the middle circle there, that is representative of the growing innovation ecosystems across Africa. Paystack is a Nigerian fintech, which was recently acquired by Stripe, which some of you may know, it's a California-based fintech, and was acquired for over $200 million. So this is a great validation for the Nigerian innovation system, ecosystem, um, but as well as the quality of technology that's coming out of the continent. And then finally, the African continental free trade area, which was also mentioned by Mayor Scarpiti, which is the largest world, um, trade block since the World Trade Organization. And uh, this is gonna be really important for boosting intra-Africa trade. It has the potential to boost regional income by 7%, which is around $450 billion. When we come to infrastructure, we can characterize it as all main networks that support economic and social activity. Now I've grouped it here in four main buckets. It can be grouped in various ways. The first one being water and sanitation. The second icon there represents power. The third one, ICT. And the fourth one is transport. Now the thing about infrastructure across the world, but particularly in Africa is infrastructure facilitates growth. So this is reflected in the fact that infrastructure is a direct input into the GDP calculation. It also has a multiplier effect. So it's been well documented that when you invest in infrastructure, you get um, impacts, multiplied impacts in adjacent and downstream sectors. And there's also a higher benefits realization, particularly in Africa, because we're so far behind other regions of the world as far as infrastructure development, whatever is invested in infrastructure in Africa or whatever is developed there tends to go a lot further than other regions of the world. But the other thing about infrastructure is that the growth trends that we already highlighted actually demand infrastructure. So for the continental free trade area to really work, there has to be manufacturing capability. There has to be a good network, transport network, um, et cetera. For urbanization, just to cater to, to the millions that will be um, added to African cities over the next few years. We need good infrastructure. And of course, innovation ecosystems require steady energy. Um, they require good telecommunications, et cetera. So infrastructure is a priority for African public and private sector. In terms of quantifying the need, I just pulled up a couple of stats here, which I think are illuminating. Only 1.9% of global manufacturing happens in Africa, which, is, um, which makes no sense because a large amount, the majority of some of the most critical raw materials, minerals, et cetera, are actually sourced in Africa. 60% of businesses cite infrastructure as their biggest constraint to daily operations within Africa. And then there are about 580 million people who are still without access to electricity in Africa. This table here is just a, a breakdown um, from the African Development Bank in terms of the actual financing need um, per, uh, per subsector of infrastructure. So you can see, as Mayor Scarpiti mentioned, 130 to $170 billion a year um, in terms of financing need. The shortfall of that is 68 to $108 billion a year.
Now, I think it's important to note that we don't have to close the entire financing gap in order to experience high growth. That's not what we're aiming for, but this is a way of just demonstrating how large the need is on the continent. So finally, the question is, well, here we are, what does this mean for Canadians? And to speak to this, we have three very reputable organizations which have already been mentioned. We've, we have Lisa Pogue, who's a trade commissioner from Global Affairs Canada, Kevin Sullivan um, from Export Development Canada, and John Farrow from Lee International Limited. So they will now each take turns in the same order to present to us uh, what their offerings are and their experience on the continent, and then we'll flow into a discussion question and answer period. So with that, I would love to turn it over to Lisa Pogue. Lisa, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Hello? Yes, good, excellent. Okay, now I'm gonna um, share my screen with you. Why does technology never work when you want it to? Okay, up we go. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to speak to you today um, to talk to you about uh, the Canadian Trade Commissioner Service. It's part of Global Affairs Canada. And uh, as the minister said, it's been serving Canadian companies for 150 years free of charge. Um, globally, we have just over 1,000 employees, 40% of which are Canadian, and 65% are engaged abroad. Uh, it's important to note that clients of the TCS are already successful businesses in Canada that have a good track record of sales domestically and have a demonstrated commitment to export markets. We um, are fortunate to have offices in 21 uh, places in continental Africa um, in our embassies, high commissions, we have 17 in Sub-Saharan Africa and four in North Africa. These additional countries are, um, are covered uh, through our uh, 21 offices and um, often with honorary councils in place. Now, what do we do to help um, people wanting to export um, into, uh, into, uh, into Africa? We have four key services. Um, the first of which is offered here in Canada. It is to help um, folks looking to export abroad. It is to help them get prepared, make sure, offer them whatever advice we can, um, discuss capabilities, um, discuss which country perhaps within um, continental Africa would have the best opportunities. And we, um, we do also, very importantly, offer funding in support of this. To be eligible, um, you have to have less than 500 employees and a revenue within the last 12 months between $100,000 and $100 million. Basically, uh, the Can Export Program provides 75 cent dollars, a grant for 75 cent dollars for eligible costs, up to almost $100,000 a year. What does it cover? It can help you with doing in-depth market research. It can help you to participate in trade shows and fairs. It is also very good um, for marketing um, tools. Um, a lot of uh, folks now are using search engine optimization during the, these challenging times to reach out to clients. And also it can help with um, some intellectual property pr uh, protection and advice on uh, business and legal matters in country. The second core service is offered by my colleagues abroad. 
They will help if you ask um, with a market potential assessment. Basically, um, they will take a look at your service offering and let you know if there's any sort of impediments to sales. I'll give an example. Uh, let's say you were offering something and you wanted to have uh, the method of payment being through a cell phone application. Well, then you'd want to double check what the cell phone penetration rate is in the country that you're in and also whether or not um, the banking um, situation would be uh, amenable to this kind of payment. And so they're, they're, they're really very, very good at helping to understand if there would be any impediment. The second service on my colleagues abroad offer is uh, they can qualify contacts. And this is uh, particularly useful when you're approached about a project and you want to double check um, and verify um, the bona fides of your potential partner. And you indeed want to confirm that um, the proponent of the project, say the Ministry of Roads, uh, has in fact got the $50 million to pay for your project in the bank. So there's a lot of ways that we can help um, to qualify the contacts um, that you will be dealing with uh, abroad. Our fourth key service is, um, is problem solving. And that happens when You've been dealing with us and you come to us and you're having problems. You're unsure about a bidding, um, a bidding practice or your, your materials are caught in customs or you're not understanding um, you know, some of the business practices that are happening. So all of which is to say, um, there is no wrong door into global affairs. Uh, at the Ontario Regional Office, we are organized sectorally. I am the infrastructure lead, but come to me if your product is in clean tech or an environment, I will connect you with the right person who can help you. So my contact information is on the screen. And just remember, there's no wrong door into global affairs. Contact us and we'll get you in touch with the right person. Having said that, I am going to now turn this over to my colleague, Kevin Sullivan from EDC, and he will share with you EDC's offering. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, thank you, Tapfuma, uh, the municipality of, uh, of Markham, Mayor Scarpitti, uh, Minister Ng, um, panelists and, uh, and distinguished guests. I want to take just a few minutes to provide uh, a brief overview of EDC, uh, who we are, what we do, uh, but most importantly, dive into specifically how uh, you, uh, the audience, can leverage EDC to, uh, to take advantage of the, the opportunities um, uh, in Africa, as, as Tapuna and others mentioned, the opportunities are, are certainly immense. Uh, so EDC, who, who we are, uh, we are Canada's export credit agency. Uh, so we're a crown corporation uh, wholly owned by, by you, our, our shareholder. Uh, we're financially self-sustaining, uh, and that is we, we price uh, to risk. So the loans that we engage in uh, are on uh, commercial principles. Uh, we've been in the market for over 75 years now. Uh, so EDC was established uh, right around the end of the Second World War, where, again, the opportunities were immense globally. Uh, but the, the uncertainty that holds back uh, then and is still true today, the opportunity that, that is, is there um, and the hesitancy of Canadian companies to go out and take advantage of these opportunities uh, is, is, uh, is, is a concern. So EDC is here to provide top cover. So if you are able to go out, uh, obtain a contract, uh, purchase order, uh, participate in a, in a project financing opportunity, we will, at the end of the day, ensure that you are paid. So that is the, the fundamental uh, pillar of EDC, uh, why we were established then and why we are still uh, relevant today. So our mission is, is uh, again, to help companies to go, take advantage of those opportunities uh, to grow and succeed in markets where 
uh, there is indeed uh, some risk. If we could just go to the next uh, slide, Sandra. So we EDC, I know that uh, there are many on the line who uh, are in, in, in the GTA, but uh, across Canada as well. So I just wanted to highlight the fact that we do have offices coast to coast to coast. Uh, so please, uh, as Lisa mentioned, you know, reach out to myself and I'm happy to uh, put you in touch with, uh, with our teams locally in, in Canada. Same goes for our international representation. We, we do uh, co-locate often with uh, the Trade Commissioner Services uh, and have standalone offices as well in those markets. Uh, so uh, we uh, highlighting South Africa uh, or Africa as, as, a, as, as uh, multiple markets, uh, we have uh, as uh, Jean-Bernard uh, Ruggieri, who's our chief representative for, for the African uh, markets. Uh, next slide, uh, two slides, please, Sandra. So EDC in Africa, just a, a highlight of, of EDC's uh, financial highlights uh, in Africa. Uh, last year, we, uh, our volume uh, was uh, two and a half billion. Uh, so as Tapuna mentioned, the, the financing gap is, is significant. Uh, we, are, we are very active in the market, uh, looking to close that gap in support of Canadian companies operating uh, in, in African markets. Um, infrastructure is a, is a significant uh, part of our portfolio and we see it as, uh, you know, we're very optimistic about the, the opportunities uh, in the infrastructure sector. Uh, you know, very clearly as well, the extractive sector is, is, uh, is very um, uh, heavy for, for EDC as well as information and communication technologies, uh, light manufacturing, which is, uh, is significant uh, and growing as well as resources and, and transportation. Uh, next slide, uh, please, Sandra. So how can we help you? Uh, I mentioned um, at the beginning how, you know, the fundamental piece of EDC is here. We're here to provide top cover. One of the p main pillars of EDC is in fact that protection. Uh, and, and it comes in, in many forms, uh, primarily in, in trade credit uh, coverage. And so what does that mean? That means that if you have an opportunity in African markets, whether it's uh, from your team locally going to, to drum up business uh, or whether it's a solicitation directly from uh, from a, an entity in, in, in Africa, perhaps somebody uh, on this call as well, uh, we will help do that upfront due diligence. So whether it's an opportunity of 100 million uh, or an opportunity of 100,000, uh, we can work with you to understand the overall project, to understand the overall opportunity and the entities uh, involved in this project. At least I mentioned that the Trade Commissioner Service can help you with that due diligence as well. So our focus is very specific to the credit risk. So we will help you uh, focus your resources uh, on the opportunities that are um, within the size and scope of, of, uh, of your company, but also uh, what the buyer risk uh, it dictates. So we will help guide the, the opportunities and help focus your, your efforts on, on good opportunities and provide you ultimately with the peace of mind that, uh, that you will be paid. So once you win that business, uh, that, uh, you know, that's a, a very a good and exciting milestone. And, and oftentimes that means that there will be a financing opportunity as well. It's challenging going into new markets, uh, whether it be Africa or Asia or South America, when you're engaging with a new or even uh, a long-term relationship um, and there is an expectation that, um, you know, you are to deliver those, the goods or services and, and uh, there's a requirement to, um, you know, there's a period of which where you're not going to be paid. So that is where EDC, uh, we will partner with your financial institution, uh, whether it's providing guarantee support uh, or direct financing to help you uh, undertake these, these opportunities in, uh, in infrastructure or, or otherwise, to allow you to have the working capital and the flexibility to be able to offer the terms that are being uh, requested from your buyer uh, or buyers in Africa so that you can take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, 
I won't get into the specifics, but but you know, just to give one example of a of a, a, a Canadian engineering company that we work very closely with, that uh, they were in the power infrastructure space. They did uh, restoration towers for for the uh, for power lines. Uh, so you know, they won a nice uh, nice piece of business there, uh, but it also required them to have inventory located in that market. It required them to invest and grow a team uh, in Angola and then subsequently Ghana uh, and other markets as well. So they had to invest to grow their business in the markets where they had this opportunity. Uh, so again, there's an example of EDC uh, partnering uh, with both Canadian financial institutions and financial institutions in market to, to allow them to take, uh, take advantage of these opportunities. And with that, uh, you know, the knowledge piece as well, we're very happy to help um, to review contractual uh, opportunities uh, to understand whether it's bonding requirements, um, risk mitigation, uh, or others. We're happy to um, to to work with you and your business to uh, to take advantage of these opportunities. So, I'll, just the next slide, Sandra. So, this is a um, just a highlight of of uh, markets where uh, we're very active in. Um, and some, some markets where we're a little bit more um, proactive than others. Um, and and um, so I won't get into detail on this uh, at, at this time, uh, but uh, I understand uh, when we get into q and I can, can jump into that as, as, as well. Reach out to myself uh, or, uh, and or Terry to, uh, to understand specifically the markets where, where our focus is. Next slide, Sandra. And that, uh, just with that, I'll, I'll leave uh, contact information for myself, uh, Terry uh, Jean Bernard, and uh, we'll leave it at that. And uh, again, look forward to uh, fielding your questions. Uh, Tapuma, did you want to introduce uh, John? Sure. Um, so, John Farrow is with Lee, Lee International Limited and is the president of Lee International. Um, limited, and he will now do a presentation on their work uh, in Africa. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, it's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to you this morning. First of all, I'd like to thank Mayor Scarpetti for his, his kind remarks and um, to thank him for running such a great city. Um, Lee, Lee has its head office in Markham. And a lot of our, 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 our people live here and, they, and it's, a, it's a great place to be. Um, my, my, my purpose today is to um, talk about the infrastructure of business in Africa, but it's a very large topic and I've got a very short period of time. And so what I'm gonna do is just talk about our experience and I've been particularly asked to talk about um, the challenges and the approaches that small and medium-sized businesses uh, might, might uh, take. So this slide shows how I'm gonna go through that. In order, when you are gonna talk about our experience, um, you need to understand our background. So there were a consulting firm that's been around for 65 years. Um, and, and though we're currently working in 10 countries in Africa and have over a, hundred people on the ground in Africa. 20 years ago, we had no permanent staff in Africa. And, and, and so that's it. It's important for those people who are just entering that market to understand how there is the opportunity to, to grow. And I think another thing to bear in mind when we're, you're listening to what I say is to appreciate there's a difference between being in the professional service business, which is what we are in terms of being civil engineers, and urban planners and being in the product supply business. And uh, one of the challenges for the, uh, for, for the smaller companies is working um, on infrastructure, um, which are very large projects in international markets. And I'm going to talk about how I see uh, and how we have worked with small companies in the past. One point I make about our background is that our, our growth in Africa um, had been uh, had really accelerated over the last 10 years when we decided to put people on the ground in Africa and focus on developing long-term relationships country by country. 
um, the service business involves trust. And if you're going to deliver a, a service to a faraway country, you need to have people on the ground who can meet uh, with the, um, in many cases, the organizations you're going to be servicing. So this shows you um, where we're present in Africa. Uh, we've completed, we've got 54 projects of which uh, about 34 have been completed. And what's notable about this, this slide is this mainly in East Africa. And that tells you how, um, what our strategy has been. And, 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 and you would well ask, why is it only in East Africa? We started off uh, uh, by putting permanent staff on the ground in, in Ethiopia. And then um, the logistics meant that we expanded country by country. But the other thing to recognize, and this is the important thing people don't think about, is that the people who run infrastructure in these countries um, are a relatively small group, even such a large place as Africa, and they all talk to each other. So if you do a good job with one country, they recommend you to the government of the next country. And they talk to each other uh, at conferences and get together on a regular basis. And so the idea of, pro, uh, of growing your business um, systematically uh, and, and logically um, from within one country and then from one country to another is, 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 is a good one. I thought it's a good idea because everybody asked me about this. Well, what are the challenges of doing this? And the challenges are that though you've got a big market, the opportunities are fragmented. And this means there's a high cost of sales, especially in the early days. So you've got to recognize there's a high cost of sales. You've got to understand also that in the, when you're in the service business, you've got to understand client needs. You've got to get close to the, the clients and understand their needs better than other people if you're going to be competitive. So that, that's an important thing to do. You've got to, you're going to be dealing with uncertain operating environment. There's cultures different in different, different countries in Africa. There's, there's stuff. Tafuma pointed out the many languages, et cetera, and different approaches and different processes, different histories. So you, you've got to deal with this uncertainty in, in operating environment. And I come back to the point when you're delivering a service, trust is key and the clients have got to learn to trust you and you've got to learn how to trust the clients. And the other thing to remember is you've got to have staff who are willing to be away from home for extended periods of time. Something that uh, the idea of fly in, fly out, um, uh, consulting and servicing really is, 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 is not something that is, uh, is the currency of today. So given those challenges, why do we pursue international projects? We do it because when you're in the services business, you, you, have, you, you improve the service you deliver by working on more and more projects and you learn more quickly. So that's one reason we do it. Secondly, professionals like to be challenged and we want to attract the brightest and the best and they demand that we work in, in interesting markets. And thirdly, we, we heard about the fast growth of, of cities in Africa. One thing to recognize is that Canada has a history of fast growth cities and therefore we've, therefore we've, got, a, uh, we've got a lot of expertise to share and, and the expertise that we, we develop really in places like the GTA with respect to infrastructure is very relevant to these large growing cities in, in Africa. Bottom line is we do it to stay competitive. Now, uh, I'm, uh, our business is to do with sewer and water and transportation, but I put this slide together to, to summarize what the World Bank and the African Development Bank had spent on infrastructure in the last five years. And while transportation and water and sanitation account for two thirds of the expenditures, um, health and education, agriculture and power accounted for a third. And those sectors are interesting because they tend to be um, smaller scale projects that, that to be involved in, and that's more attractive to the small and medium enterprise companies. So how do you approach that market, which is, the, uh, and, and, I, and I think you start off by doing a realistic assessment of your own capability. 
you know, so first of all, as, uh, uh, as Lisa Polk said, you've got to have a track record with Canadian clients. The first thing when you go in and meet with a African government and you ask, let's say you want to do work for them, is they ask, they say, what have you done for um, Ontario or British Columbia or the federal government? Um, you've also got to recognize because people are going to be away that you mustn't overstretch your staff. So you've got to have the staff capacity to keep your businesses, existing business flourishing while you explore Africa. Also, you've got to have the funding to deal with the initial costs of marketing and hiring. And particularly when you're exploring investment opportunities, you've got to have a successful track record with Canadian investors so that they're willing to commit the money when you go in and you say you want to look at a project that they're willing to back you. So here's the suggestion, uh, our recommendation about how small and medium companies um, should approach the market. Um, first of all, start with the multi, uh, multilateral development banks um, who funded projects. I recommend this as an approach because they uh, provide um, uh, some security and some order and, and approaches which Canadian companies can relate to very well. So you want to review the country strategies of the World Bank, the African Development Bank, and new on the scene and, and, and more recent on the scene is the, Af is the um, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which is doing projects in Africa. And you want to review their strategies. And that gives you a sense of where the money is going to go in infrastructure over the next five years. You want to then, when you've got some focus, discuss with the Trade Commissioner Service in Canada and in Africa. Then you need to select a sector, and you need to be very realistic about sector that, that you're that, that you're you're selecting. I mean, if you've got expertise in power, go after power. Don't go after transportation. Now, the fourth point here is a very important one: is if you're a smaller company, and because it's hard to get on these big multi-million-dollar um, consulting projects where you've got to design. Um, hundreds of kilometers of highway or ring roads or railways, et cetera. Um, but if you're a smaller company, obviously that's too big uh, for you to take on. But there is a big opportunity in partnering with um, inter large international companies who, who take on these projects because they often need some of the specialist expertise that you've got. So look at which Canadian uh, firms are taking on these, the, 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 these international projects. Um, and, and approach them to partner with them. And you find them by reviewing the earlier competitions and finding out which companies have been successful to partner with. Then you can, you can approach them. And amazingly enough, they'll, they'll, they'll be very receptive to hear from you because they're, um, they're in, in terms of the infrastructure world, there is a shortage of expertise worldwide. And so um, if you've got expertise and you've got a track record and you can contribute to the projects that they've won, they'll be very pleased to hear from you. Then you've got to bear in mind, you've got to build relationships, not, with, not just with these companies, but with the governments that you're going to work with and also with uh, African-based companies that you might want to par partner with. And lastly, you know, and this is, this is uh, I, I think, is a post-COVID uh, recommendation. You've got to visit the countries regularly in order to build mutual trust and confidence. They've got to see your face and they've got to know you uh, because you don't, if you're a civil servant in one of these countries, you don't make a big commitment to a, a consulting firm um, unless you know them and you have confidence in them. It's, um, you know, it's, the, these people are, in a sense, betting their job uh, when, when they're making selections on big projects. So how do you find projects um, to, to work on? So start with the multilateral development banks. Most infrastructure in Africa is financed through the MDBs, not all of it, but most of it. Uh, so you look at, look at the multilateral development banks or you look and you look at the bilateral programs, uh, they, most, most developed countries have them with Africa and, and see what they're, what they're funding. You review these programs for opportunities and you review the country strategies from the NDBs because that will give you the basis for medium term marketing plans. And an example of what, how these opportunities are presented by the, um, by the NDBs is presented in the next slide. When you go and look at um, 
uh, their websites, you will see, and this is Ethiopia, and, and, and this is a pipeline of projects that are coming down in the transportation sector. And you can see it identifies um, what type of project it is, which authority there it is, where it's happening. So you can fly directly from uh, Toronto to uh, Addis Ababa every, every day, and you can go and see the Ethiopia Roads Authority, and you can go and call uh, and arrange a meet, meeting with them to talk about what's, what's upcoming. So that, that's how you can find pipeline projects that are coming up. You can also find out which companies have been successful in the past. So in summary, let me say, there are a large number of opportunities in, uh, more than Canadian companies recognize for which Canadian companies are very well qualified. I think you've got to recognize that because it's a fragmented market, it requires investment and focus and a focus strategy. And um, normal Canadian, Canadian businesses apply and building trust through relationships with the client is very important. And lastly, Canadians are, are welcome. And let me finish um, by, by telling you um, uh, uh, about going down to Botswana um, to, to talk with the government there and the, 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 the position of the assistant of the deputy minister of transportation was, I'm so pleased to meet a Canadian coming all the way to Botswana. You're the first one who's ever come and visited here. And we are very interested in having uh, Canadian uh, engineers come and work on our projects. An amazing welcome for someone who uh, who traveled all the, all the way from Toronto um, to Botswana. So, um, don't expect, uh, you can expect in many cases to receive a very well, warm welcome. So thank you very much. And I, I look forward to your questions. Um, Tafuma, back to you. Thank you so much, John and Lisa and Kevin for those informative presentations. Um, if you can just turn your cameras on and mics on, we're, we have a few minutes actually, only a few minutes to get into questions. So when, when our viewers, when you actually registered, you submitted questions and what we've done is collated those questions and um, I think someone's got something playing in the background there. But, um, I, and John, you can just end share. There we go, perfect. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna throw out, we've got a few minutes. So I'd ask you, Lisa and Kevin to, and, and John, to please keep your responses pretty short and after this, you know, we have shared our contact information. Folks can also reach out to us. We can continue discussion. So the first question I'm going to ask, um, one of the very popular questions was around accessing funding. So for Canadian companies, whether you're an entrepreneur, a startup, you know, or a small outfit, right up to corporate size, um, project developer, there's a question around how to access funding to explore new markets or to finance deals. So Lisa, could you perhaps start by giving us some perspective on what the steps would be? Sure, let me, um, let me first see if I can share my screen a little bit more uh, effectively this time. Um, I, have some, uh, I have some resources um, that uh, I've noted. Um, there is a huge, huge, huge um, spectrum um, for the funding available. Um, uh, at one end, we have funding that is really meant for small and medium-sized enterprises. I dealt with that earlier on in my presentation, I talked about um, can export SME funding. I really would encourage everyone who is seriously thinking about going to Africa to access this. You um, will get um, refunded 75 cents on the dollar um, for your, uh, your work to develop um, targeted market research and plans. Um, Kevin will talk to you um, later about um, uh, opportunities and funding options that happen more in the middle spectrum. But I really wanted to highlight um, the African Investment Forum. This um, is for the experienced project developer, someone who has a large project that they're looking to uh, deal with or get funding for. And it's not all that well known. It's um, the African Development Bank 
uh, is actually the key proponent of this. And they have nine particular partners. I'll show you who they are in a minute. But basically, this is a very excellent structured platform to discuss and advance um, projects to more bankable stages. Um, here are the partners. I mean, uh, the Development Bank of Southern, uh, Southern Africa, you know, the Islamic Development Bank, the European Investment Bank. There's a lot of very clever people with very deep pockets who are very committed to this. Um, the investment forum has four basic different um, uh, components. But what's really interesting is that um, the, they have a seminar or a meeting every year. Unfortunately, it was canceled this year. And they put in 19, uh, 2019, they did billions of dollars worth of deals. It's really very important. And you can go online and see what the deals are, where they are, and you can get involved if you're interested in investing. And you can also get your deal put up there. There's a very structured way to go about doing it. Again, I can't do it justice, um, but really do check out uh, the Africa Investment Forum. It is a, a very amazing um, institution. Kevin, I'm going to now um, send it over to you to talk Thank a little you, bit more about the mid-spectrum. Sure. And uh, I'll just go very quickly here. Uh, and by doing so, I'll, I'll provide a couple of examples, one of which... Uh, you know, when it, when it comes to, to funding opportunities in Africa, we work back from what the opportunity is. Uh, and to give one example of a, of a you know, a small mid-size, mid-market uh, Canadian company operating in, in the mining infrastructure space, they had an opportunity with, um, in fact, it was a supplier of theirs in, in South Africa who uh, the, the two entities had an opportunity to create a joint venture uh, in Angola, uh, specific to uh, a contract uh, or a project. Um, so we, we engaged with the Canadian company, uh, the, the bank here in Canada and also in, in South Africa to have a look at the, the investment opportunity. Uh, we, you know, there was a, an asset purchase, uh, so cap, CapEx uh, investment required. Uh, so we had a good close look at that. Um, gain comfort and through our guarantee solutions uh, with again in partnership with the Canadian bank and local bank uh, we were able to get comfortable with making an investment and, and also protecting the assets in that market so that the the banks were comfortable in, in coming forward with uh, with the, the funding uh, necessary for it. Uh, another example in infrastructure is a you know an airport opportunity in uh, Cote d'Ivoire on uh, the Ivory Coast where Again, it was a little bit more, a little bit uh, outside the comfort level of the Canadian bank to uh, finance the assets that were going into the airport, and the term was was quite long. Uh, so again, we we worked in partnership with um, both Canadian and local banks to to understand the structure, understand the risk, uh, and apply our guarantees uh, and direct funding. Uh, direct financing to to help the Canadian uh, and local companies uh, partner together to uh, to to leverage the the funding available and 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 execute on on the contract opportunity. So, just a couple of examples. But uh, to short answer, Tafuma is you know we look at the opportunity, we work back from that, uh, and understanding the risks involved and and the willingness of other financial partners to to come to the table, uh, and where there's a, a little bit of an enhanced risk, that's where where ADC looks to engage. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks for that informative response. So in our last few minutes, what I'm going to do is sort over to you, John, and I'm going to ask you for a very, in, in two minutes or less, um, concise response to a question that a lot of people have around Africa. I think as an operator there, you've, um, or as a consultant there, you've already um, displayed the potential, but you know, people still want to ask about risk. Um, and we're not going to talk about currency risk, etc. What I want to ask you is about the perceived idea of social political risk um, on the continent. There's some obviously places where it's very real and other places where it's perceived risk. But in a very concise answer, what is your recommendation to entrepreneurs who want to enter the market and are concerned about that? 
Okay, my, my recommendation is, is we're talking about entrepreneurs who want to work in the infrastructure sector. Mm -hmm. And is I, I think the, uh, our approach when we go into a new market is to look initially for projects from, which are funded by the multilateral development banks because they play a role with the government of the country that you're going into in terms of uh, making sure that um, the, the, the governments do it properly. And as they are lending the money and, and in some cases granting money, they exercise a good deal of control. And if things begin to go wrong, then um, they, they'll step in and try and help put it right. So when I'm going into a country I've never worked in before, I like to start, first of all, uh, with a project that's funded by one of the multilateral development banks. That's, that's the way I, I reduce my risk. When I'm comfortable mm. with the government there, and when, they've, when I've earned their trust and they've earned my trust, then I, I'll expand and do work in infrastructure in, 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 which isn't funded by MDBs. But initially, I'd like to go with MDB funded projects. Fantastic. Thank you for that strategy, the entry strategy. So folks, um, as you can see, we've just touched the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more um, to be explored and discussed. And this is a fantastic opportunity to get that conversation going with the city of Markham. So I look forward to what we're going to do in the future. And I'd like to hand it over to Christina now. Thank you, Tapuma. Uh, now I'd like to welcome Councillor Khalid Uzman, who's the co-chair of our Culture and Economic Development Committee, to say a few words in closing today's session. Oh, you're on mute, uh, Khalid. And I'd also like to say that okay. uh, Okay, great. And another person who's on council who we benefit from his private sector expertise, having run successful business over the years as well. So thank you, Councillor Usman. Well, thank you, Christina. And thank you to the audience uh, and all the presenters. Uh, you know, it was, I would say it was a very busy morning. So um, it was good. It was good learning. And I hope that the webinar has provided you with the practical advice on accessing the African markets and how to take advantage of all the opportunities that they provide. To Tafuma, Lisa, Kevin, and John, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. It has been an insightful discussion. I learned a lot today. And you know, it's amazing, especially the, the last part that uh, John uh, shared with us uh, how to make sure that you're safe and you do business. And, you know, the whole idea is to participate in the economy. I think uh, both for Canadians and, and the country that you go into, I think this is fabulous. As Canadians, we must continue the, on the journey of economic and trade diversifications. And we know from today's webinar that the African continent, with its rate of growth and economic potential, should be high on our list of target marks. To be successful, our companies need help, and it's good to know that we have resources to support businesses that are going global. EDC has the financing and bonding solutions businesses need to complete to compete in the global markets and the trade commissioner services can be enormously helpful, particularly to small and medium sized businesses. At the local level, Markham Economic Development Team is here to help you connect resources, new markets and customers and to help you grow your business with confidence. Once again, thank you very much I hope you'll join us again next time when Christina can organize it again uh, in a seminar like this. And today you can see it has been a very successful one because at one point in time, we had over 65 participants. So that is fantastic to hear and see that how much interest there exists. So I wanna wish you all the best and thank you for sharing your knowledge and your experience with us because this is important. And for us, all of us to do what we really are here for, to do business. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Usman. Very well said. Appreciate you being here today as well. And I just wanted to also thank my colleague, Sandra Tam, Senior Business Development Officer, again, um, for the wonderful uh, work that she's done in leading this webinar. Um, so thank you again. I wanted to just to quickly address a question that came in around the Canada Export SMEs program, um, the Can Export program, that is. Uh, there was an announcement made, I believe, yesterday uh, by Minister Ng related to uh, sort of a, a bit of a switch of that program. That program is available to support virtual engagement in trade shows and virtual marketing for companies who are doing business globally. So we'll send out a package of information after this meeting that includes a link for more information about Can Export, as well as the speaker presentations and the link to the recording of today's session. Um, so you'll have that all with you, including the contact information of our panelists today. So once again, thank you uh, to all our panelists and to everybody who participated today, our special guests uh, uh, from within Canada and around the world. I see Mayor uh, Scarpitti is uh, displaying his video. I'm not sure if you wanted to say a couple of words. Okay, so you're good. Thank you. Uh, thank you for participating, Mr. Mayor, and uh, a pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, thanks again. Take care.